keep our, um, our seminar very yeah. exciting. Thank you. Go ahead. Then. OK. Um, uh, yeah, so, um, so first, uh, you, you see that uh, this work was done in China. So how did this happen? Uh, so what happened was uh, uh, in 2016, uh, I was on sabbatical in China. Uh, and then my lunch buddy in Providence got a Nobel Prize that year. And then so he invited me to Stockholm. And then the president of Suzhou University, uh, this is a city near Shanghai, uh, heard that I'm a good friend with Professor Kostlos and they said, can you invite Professor Kostlos to, um, to Suzhou uh, to visit them? And that would be the first Nobel laureate to visit their campus. And then I said, what do I get in exchange? He said, well, we'll give you money to do whatever you want. So we did physics with it. So. Um, so, um, uh, so, uh, Liu mentioned that I, I did nanopores. So, in fact, I, I, a full confession that I was invited to China to, uh, uh, to develop a nanopore technology that was uh, uh, made a, um, and Liu can tell you that my idea of sequencing DNA in nanopores was very unpopular in the United States. And they should reject me three times. Uh, um, and then, so I couldn't get any funding. So, it, and then the China, this China, this notorious, uh, infamous uh, China Thousand Talent Plan invited me to, to do it in China. So they, this is my idea. Uh, I developed it in China. The idea is um, I have a DNA in nanopores. So the idea is not to have one nanopore, but two nanopores in series. So this way, it allows you to measure how long a nucleotide, uh, a, 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 a oligonucleotide attach a probe that attach as a function of time. So the reason this is important because then uh, it allows you to perform what's called kinetic proofreading and it so allows you to distinguish correct from incorrect binding. So that was the idea. And then so I, I, I did it. Uh, of course, I gave full disclosure to US government and the Brown University about what I was doing in China. And then eventually um, the, the Chinese uh, student that I taught uh, was able to reproduce what we did in, in Delft in Netherlands. Uh, uh, leave you remember this back in the 2002 and 2003 when I was on sabbatical there, and then I, I leave you was a postdoc there. So I had a, a pleasure of learning everything about uh, nanopores from him. And then this was a, a, a machine that the Chinese made. I don't know whether this machine will ever be made into the market because it's more complicated to, to, to build something that's marketable. But uh, th th that's the idea. Okay, so the um, uh, you said what I did in in China. The Chinese invited me to do this, but uh, uh, of course I spent most of the time actually uh, talking to Mike. And so, so one thing that brought uh, me back into Colloy, um, uh, brought Mike and I together on on this uh, colloidal physics was a long-standing question that we had in our mind is regarding uh, what happens if you make a colloidal crystal less perfect, okay? So uh, a colloidal crystal is very interesting because they are, they are small enough that they, they, they can uh, show uh, thermodynamic behavior. So in other words, the thermal energy is relevant in the rearrangement of the particles. Um, but at the same time, and there are big enough you can actually see using an ordinary uh, optical microscope. Okay, so, so there are many reasons why we want to uh, study colloidal crystals. Uh, back in the old days, I actually have to justify. Now, uh, soft condensed matter colloidal crystal is now mainstream, right? So th this slide, I think this particular slide was made 20 years ago um, uh, to, to, to convince people this is interesting. Today, that now many people are doing this, right? So the uh, it, it's uh, it's not a surprise anymore. So one thing that uh, 
Mike Macoslos and I have been uh, interested in for uh, for many uh, decades. What's the effect of disorder? Okay, so um, according to Larkin, who unfortunately passed away uh, a couple of years ago, um, uh, he wrote in a uh, discussed in a, his famous paper in 1970 regarding uh, inhomogeneities in type two superconductors. Okay. So he made the point that there's a difference between floating and a quenched disorder. The idea of uh, 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 what he said was that floating uh, disorder is essentially harmless. It does not create a, a, a big damage into the um, lattice uh, of the vortices. But if you have random pinning sites, then that will be fundamentally different. So, so he made a, a difference, uh, um, a distinction between floating and the quench disorder. Um, and the later, five years later, um, uh, it was very interesting because during that time was, it was a Cold War. Uh, the uh, Larkin's paper was published in, in Russia, in Russian, and then the Americans didn't read the, uh, the Russian papers. So these two um, uh, uh, Americans, um, uh, 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 Joe Emery and Shankar Ma wrote a very famous paper regarding what happens if you have a random magnetic field on something like an XY magnet. Okay, so so they 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 basically made the argument that if you have a random magnetic field that's acting locally on individual spins, and then you will create a distortion in the lattice, but the cost in a range of a size of L, the cost of the energy cost would be uh, L to the D minus two. This minus two is because say the, the spins are can, can be continuously rotated. If it's ice in discrete symmetry, this would be one, okay? But uh, the energy gain from the random field is L to the D divided by two because it's the square root of the volume of the, the uh, uh, the spin that uh, 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 you create a, a, a cluster, okay? So, so what, what in this means, if the, the gain from the random field is larger than the cost, then the gain will always win, right? So that there's a critical dimension. Obviously this, uh, if you balance this, two, you, you will see that the critical dimension is four. So which means below four dimensions, the random field always win. Okay, so this was the same conclusion as Larkin reached in 1970. And so in America, it's called the Emory Ma theorem. Later in the 90s, when Larkin immigrated to the United States, and everyone recognized that this should be called the Larkin Emory Ma theorem. Okay, so what did this Larkin Emory Ma theorem says that in two dimensions or three dimensions, the real physical system we can deal with, same, of course, 1D without saying, okay, long range order cannot survive. Uh, uh, due, due to the random field, if you have quenched the disorder. Okay, 1D uh, long range order cannot survive. Uh, that was well known even without the disorder because the thermal uh, uh, fluctuation would destroy long range order. So that was uh, understood a long time ago by uh, um, Landau and, and, the, uh, and the Pyros. Okay, so. In, uh, in superconductivity field, what it means is if you have a, a, a lattice of vortices, so this, the blue ones are the this order superconductive order parameters. So this is vortex core. And uh, these red lines are the magnetic vortex field, the magnetic field. You see that the, the vortices interact with each other through this uh, field so that uh, the vortices don't want it to be close to each other, they repel each other. So the, the, the vortex interaction can be uh, modeled by a chain of uh, 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 balls. And then the, the random potential can be modeled by this red rock, rocket landscape, okay? So you see that the, so for example, this guy would have wanted to sit here, uh, but then he will have to push this guy, okay? He would push his neighbor, for example, this guy would come here and then this guy would come here, they will push each other. So the, the, the uh, energy per unit of volume cost would go as this, because one over this length scale to the square, square here is because it's an elastic deformation, okay? And then if you count what is the, 
the you gain from the random potential would have this square root behavior as uh, 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 this is from uh, every time when you have a, a, a n random processes, and then you will get square root of n fluctuations. So, so this is the um, the fluctuation you will pick up from the random potential, and then you will see that if you plot this energy density versus this range of def uh, uh, deformation, you will see that the elastic energy goes as a, a one of r square. Okay, so what it means is uh, if you have a elastic piece. The system would really want it to be uh, uh, ordered over infinite range, okay. But if you have random potential, then there's this green line. Then the total, the global minimum, is somewhere with a finite size. What this says is that if you have like a, a elastic piece, if you place this elastic piece on some random uh, landscape. Then this this rigid piece is not a happy state. The happy state is one that is uh, uh, broken into pieces. Of course, um, uh, Romans uh, learned that right. They tried to keep a Roman Empire, but the, we know that the the, ha the more uh, uh, the, the thermodynamic ground state is uh, the happier state is where. Uh, uh, individual states are created, right? So uh, I actually gave this slide talk in China in front of a CCP Central Committee member. And he was in the audience. He was very displeased when I said uh, it's impossible to use a rigid system to keep order over a large range. And uh, is the happier state is you allow individual pieces to relax the local equilibrium. And so this didn't go well in China. So this, uh, it, it, the, the American and, and national builders, they were very smart. They went, when they created the United States, they understood this, that you needed to allow individual state flexibility uh, so you can create a, a um, uh, you can achieve a thermodynamic, you, you can achieve a global happy state. Okay, okay so back to, um, uh, uh, the, the colloid. So the, the idea, the floating disorder and the quenched disorder plays a, uh, uh, makes a huge difference. This was the quenched disorder was tested by my former student, Alexander Spetsinidis, who just got tenure. Uh, he's now uh, a tenured full professor at Sloan Kettering in New York because Sloan Kettering, like Harvard, only tenure people at full professors. Uh, at the 10th year. So he just got tenure at the Sloan Kettering. Uh, uh, Alexandros, when he was a student with me at Brown, uh, 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 actually, Scott, did you overlap with Alexandros? Uh, you probably did. Uh, okay, maybe Scott wasn't listening. Okay, it's okay. Um, um, uh, but anyway, so Alexandros, uh, 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 when he was um, a, a graduate student in my lab at Brown, uh, we tested Larkin's idea of a, a random pinning using a two-dimensional colloidal crystal. So the, the, so what he did was he took it the, um, a, a quartz substrate and he used the um, lithographic uh, methods to, to create a rough surface. And then you can see that uh, very quickly, actually with very little di uh, disorder, you, uh, you, can, uh, you will see the um, uh, destruction of uh, a quasi long range order uh, in the system. So this was uh, done by Alexandros uh, on a, a glass rough surface. And then he, he, he can prove that the system is in a glassy state. And then you, you can study the structure, uh, a disorder um, and, and, and the local order. And the, the idea of there's locking domains actually well established in this work. And then, so this is Alexandra's now quite a famous video. Um, uh, uh, so I'm, I think I can play. Okay. So you can see that in, in this are 0.3 micron uh, polystyrene particles. So that's why they jiggle so fast in real time is because they're small. Uh, uh, the work I'm going to tell you today about the um, 
a, 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 a with an isotropic uh, particles uh, is actually 2.5 micron is, is much more slower. Okay, so you, you can see one thing you can see is, is here is if you don't drive it and everybody's jiggle locally. So this is actually a, a puzzling phenomenon is still not well understood. In other words, this lurking immerial mark glassy state is it really a liquid? Okay, so this is the, was the question at the time, but still unsettled. But the one question that was settled is when you drive at a threshold of motion, what is the nature of the motion? You can see that most of the particles stays where they are. So this is a trajectory of 1.5 seconds. And then there are, uh, you will see that there are particles actually was able to, their, their trajectories were able to co connect. And then so there were global motion was created. Even though it's small, it's a very small amount, but you can see a channel motion, okay? So this intermittent stick slip motion was, was still very much not understood, okay? So if you look at the velocity versus the driving force, there is this uh, well-known, uh, this uh, uh, threshold behavior um, uh, in vortices in charge density waves, okay? And then, so uh, Christina Marchetti, when she was at Syracuse, her, um, one of her former students, Faleski, did a, a very nice computer simulation of a depending dynamics of the system. What did they, the, the big story was that you see essentially phase coexistence in the system. You have particles moving and then you have particles not moving, okay? So it's essentially a coexistence phenomenon when it is driving, okay? However, when the system is not driving in, so this is log scale, okay? So zero means of course, infinity to the left. And that state is still not understood. It's something that I, I wish to return to um, in the next couple of years, okay? So back to Larkin's original 1970s prediction, he predicted, uh, you know, uh, also a very simple argument why floating disorder uh, is not as destructive as um, a, um, a quantity disorder. And then what he argued was that if you have a small amount of uh, uh, impurities, they basically their position and the in the orientation is dominated by the elasticity of the lattice. So in other words, the lattice can basically ignore the presence of small impurities. Okay, and then this is very much confirmed by our experiment. So this was an idea, Mike and I discussed. Uh, in Providence for many years, but we never got the money to do uh, research on it. So when we were in China, uh, the Suzhou president said, you can do whatever we, you want. So then Professor Zhe Xinjiang there, he does kawaii, he knows how to make all this colloidal uh, 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 system work. So we shared our thoughts and then he, uh, his uh, uh, um, colleague, uh, Hua Guang Wang, uh, who is the assistant professor there, and the graduate student pulled this off and it did a beautiful experiment on it. And then basically confirmed what the Larkin said, that in other words, this long range orientational order, the also known as quasi long range order. Quasi long range order means uh, the orientational order is long range, but the translation order is um, uh, is uh, algebraic, okay? So what it is very clear from, I don't know if you can see my cursor here, but um, what I wanna see say is here, oops. Is this plot it tells you that it's very clear the long range a orientational order, for example, here and the here is preserved. Okay, so so this uh, so this is uh, this is a very um, uh, is a very clear confirmation. Okay. 
Okay. So um, uh, back to this, um, uh, the system. This is a polystyrene in uh, water. So th this is charge stabilized. That means that uh, the um, uh, so polystyrene surface has a, uh, a surface layer of salt. So when they get it dissolved in the water and then you, uh, you pass through ion exchange resin, so you remove most of the charge and then what happens is there's a, uh, enough Coulomb interaction, even though it's, it's screened, um, uh, uh, they, they, were, they are strong enough to prevent the van der Waals force from dominating. So the, the interparticle interaction is what's called a screen Coulomb interaction. Um, at the room temperature for deionized the water, um, the, the balance is about, um, uh, uh, the, the, the violence is about 300 nanometers, okay, uh, or 0.3 microns. So this is 0.3 micron is a very, um, uh, that's in the limit of uh, is what we can do for the ionizing resin. But realistically speaking, it's, it's smaller than that. It's more like a 0.1 micron, okay, 100 nanometer. But it still is, is strong enough to prevent the van der Waals uh, force from taking over. Because if the van der Waals force taking over for colloid, they're stuck together, then you, uh, the, the particles are dead. Okay. And then in this system, one thing you can see very clearly, if we keep on increasing the number of these impurity particles, uh, this impurity particles is anisotropic particles. Okay, the rounded particles of different size, uh, it creates a, a, a different problem because then the volume of the particle is different. Okay, so then it, it has other issues um, uh, we don't want to deal with. Okay, so these particles, these anisotropic particles are the same particle. We just use a trick that Professor Zhejin Zhang's group uh, developed it was to stretch the particle to with the aspect ratio about six, okay? But the total volume is unchanged, okay? The excluded volume is unchanged. So this allows us to do a more controlled exp experiment. In other words, when we, I tell you 6.71%, that's a volume percentage of the defect, okay? So, so, so one thing you, you, you notice is that very quickly, very quickly, very quickly, you see that the orientation order gets destroyed, okay? So this orientation, so this part and then that part are no longer lined up the same, okay? So, so in other words, the orientation order is destroyed, okay? There is no quasi long range order in the system. And then, and it becomes more severe uh, when you increase the disorder. Okay, so if you look at the, if you look at the bond or agitation order, five, six, in other words, uh, this light color means one. Okay, so you see then every particle, when, without increasing, uh, without adding any impurities, Every particle, particle is six-fold coordinated, okay? When you add a 2%, most are six-fold coordinated, but you can see that they are, um, uh, the, the quasi-long range order survives. And with the increase in disorder, and then the quasi-long range order gets destroyed. Okay, so let's be quantitative about the effect of the disorder. So we, one thing we can measure is to measure this G6R as a function of R. So this is the orientational order parameter as a function of uh, the, the distance. And then you see that immediately is exponential decay. It's just degrees of uh, uh, exponential decay, okay? So from this exponential decay, we can extract a coherence length or correlation length, and as a function of the uh, 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 density of the 
the volume density of the impurity particles. You see that it follows what's called the essential singularity. You, you might recall that essential singularity was the prediction from KTHNY theory for 2D melting if this were plotted as a function of temperature. This was called the Costellus, Thales, Halpern, Nelson, Young theory, okay? And with a critical concentration about point, about 5%. Okay, so this essential singularity tells us that there is a systematic behavior that with, when you add what Larkin would call floating disorder into the system, the system, the impurities behave like a Larkin's floating disorder below 5%. After 5%, this disorder becomes essentially like a quenched disorder. So this is very puzzling, okay? This is a big puzzle. Why the system, a floating disorder, behave like a quenched disorder? So you might wonder whether there is a real distinction, fundamental distinction between um, uh, uh, between quenched disorder and the floating disorder if the disorder is too much, okay? And then this also made Mike and I, my customers and I question this fundamental assumption. We always believed that a larkin emery moss theorem cannot be applied to floating disorder. Okay, so now we believe they can. And then in fact, it made us to question whether the idea, the window glass is a um, frozen liquid and is somehow fundamentally different from a, 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 a say, uh, uh, for people familiar with the vortex glass uh, in superconductors, uh, whether there's a fundamental difference there, we, we no longer believe there is such a fundamental di distinction can be made, but uh, that question is unsettled. Okay, so Mike and I wrote a proposal this year to NSF. We want to actually go revisit this question. This long-standing belief that there is a fundamental difference between a window glass and a vortex glass, um, we don't believe uh, you can make that distinction. And uh, that's a separate talk, but um, uh, uh, I, I hope I can come back to Circus in a few years, the, the, the real person to explain uh, what do we find? Okay, so one thing we actually look into was uh, we found that after we found that there is a, looks like a, a disorder induced, essentially uh, disordering transition, uh, uh, it's probably easier to, it's fancier to call the melting, but we don't want to call the melting because we, if you look at the shear modulus of the system that can be measured from just watching the particle jiggling around, you will see that the shear modulus of the system with the increasing disorder is the first enhanced, gets enhanced, okay? The system becomes more stiff. And then at about 5%, it starts to decrease and then sharply decreasing, but it never drops to zero. So this is kind of interesting. So with increasing disorder, the system behaves first like a work hardening of alloys. I don't know if people remember this um, uh, or was ever taught is about if you take a copper wire and kneel the copper wire, if you uh, uh, pass through a die, um, uh, basically you pull the wire, you want to reduce the diameter, you, you, you pull through, you find it that after you pull through, the wire becomes harder. So this is a huge issue in metallurgy. So you actually have to anneal it and then to soften the material and then you, before you can draw down again. So this work hardening behavior can be uh, seen by, by adding some point impurities in the system. When you add too much of this, the system essentially becomes disintegrated, integrated, but it never becomes a liquid to drop to zero. Zero, we can see, right? Because if it's a true liquid, you can see 
the flowing behavior. And then this is, you can see that in bulk modules too, okay? So, oh, I'm a, a family is earlier than the, the prediction, that's okay. Okay, leave more uh, time. So um, the conclusion of our observation is that the Larkin's prediction of floating disorder is correct in the dilute limit. He didn't discuss He didn't discuss what happens if the dirt is too much or what is too much in, in his 1970s paper. So floating disorder is an issue that is worth more investigation. Okay. Um, and then we find that a 2D crystal becomes stronger with low density of impurities. So by adding some impurities to the colloidal crystal, you make it more stiff. So this is actually quite interesting there might be some interesting applications. If you want to, for example, stabilize a system, you might want to make less perfect. Um, and then when you have a high concentration of impurities, the system behaves like a, a glass or a liquid. We don't know for sure, okay? So the puzzle here is the glassy behavior remains a puzzle. Why? There are no phase separation. So. Naively, we would expect the um, this anisotropic particles will stick together and then becomes a pneumatic and it will be phase separated from the uh, colloidal crystal, okay? But it didn't happen no matter how long you wait and no matter how many times you try, okay? So this never happened. So this is a puzzle, okay? And the second puzzle is, is this glassy system is really fundamentally different from the Larkin Emory market? Okay. My intuition tells me that there is no fundamental difference. That would require some theoretical insight from our theory colleagues why floating disorder can behave like a quantity disorder when you just have like a 5% of them. Okay. Thank you very much. That's all I have uh, today. And um, um, thank you for listening. Okay, so thank you very much, Sean, uh, for the nice uh, talk. So um, we are now, we have time for questions. Feel free to, to ask questions directly. So, um okay. so one of the questions i have in mind sean uh, mm -hmm. is if you uh, this description that you made is entirely made at two-dimensional in two-dimensional case uh, right right well, this can only be uh uh okay so you, indeed uh the same issue can be raised about three dimensions. So there's no change. You don't expect, you don't anticipate any um, alteration of, of this results if you expand it in, in an extra dimension. Um, excellent question. Um, so, what will be the same and what will be different? Um, I would say the critical concentration would be different. Uh, so, because three-dimensional elasticity is stronger, okay? So, so, so 3D melting, um, every time when you see ice melt outside of your driveway, it's a first order transition, okay? So when you add a disorder to it, uh, that first order transition will be rounded. Okay, uh, there are arguments why that's, that's the case. Whether there is a essential singularity, I don't know, because fundamentally uh, KT trans, uh, the, the, the pure 2D solid melts back, it's a continuous transition, it's a KTH and a Y, but adding disorder, you create a disorder induced uh, um, KTH and Y. So, so if I'm drawing a phase diagram, oops, uh, so, so, so if I'm drawing a phase diagram, so this is for two dimensions. 
uh, if I put a disorder here, um, uh, uh, I use a five here, okay? And then so zero disorder, you have this KTHNY transition, okay? Uh, this is KTHNY, KTHNY, this is 2D melting, okay? And then with disorder, so wh what happens is a small amount of disorder basically destroyed this. So basically, I would expect this one to be something like a small amount of disorder would, so, so, so this is a floating disorder regime, regime. So this is what in here, okay? And then, and then here, so what are we observing in this experiment is along this line here, okay? In three dimension, this is the first order melting. So uh, we don't know for sure. Uh, so I anticipated this line will be higher. And then, but I don't know whether this, this point will be changed from a first order transition to continuous. That's something that actually you give me an idea. Uh, that, that would be a nice PhD thesis, in fact, um, what happens uh, in 3D. Uh, experimentally would be more challenging because you would need it to do um, a 3D imaging, um, uh, uh, but that can be done. Uh, uh, but that's something definitely worth looking at. Uh, thank you for the idea. That's a, that's a great idea. Right. Yeah. yeah well, uh, um, anyway, so please uh, let me know if you have questions. Uh, in the meantime, um, I'm trying to ask you, Sean, what do you think will be the uh, next uh, uh, avenues? Yes. Th there is a uh, raise yes. the hand. Okay. Meryl, please feel free to ask a question. Hello. Um, uh, yes. I guess um, when we were looking at that critical transition, when the long range uh, orientation was being lost i've i was wondering if you've thought about that in terms of the impurities percolating like actually making these long closed lines because for uh, me my intuition i feel like that's what would be important but. um very interesting okay so uh, uh so what you're saying is um uh as if the the defects are talking each other through the stress strain field right is that what you are um, uh, suggesting um yes i think that's one way to think about it uh, yeah it's also if if the impurities are percolating then you've got uh, essentially a boundary that can actually separate those regions yes uh, but i was that's just wondering if yeah, what you are saying is absolutely what we are seeing. The question is why. The, 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 puzzle, right. the, the puzzle is why, for example, this guy's here, this guy's here. Why don't they uh, just form a, like this? Yeah, because they are not alive. Right, but once he's here, right, you can wait for, uh, several days, nothing changes here. They just jiggle around. Right. So, so what happens is, if you look very closely, right? So what happens is, at the tip of the here, so what happens is, there is an edge dislocation here, um, and the edge dislocation here, okay? So there is a, essentially, this location pair created by the presence of this impurity particle. Right. So, so um, the system essentially locally felt is a better deal by allowing this impurity particle to come in by creating this uh, dislocation this pair. Yeah. So locally, it. Um, uh, even though thermodynamically this might be a better deal, but to go from here to there, it never or the energy barrier is too large. It could yeah, be that it's a cost. 
it could be that the energy barrier is such that the uh, the relaxation time is the age of universe. That's possible. <laughs> uh, right. Right. But that's a very good question. Yeah. We have other questions. Feel okay. free to. Yeah. Okay. So. There. Are, there. Are, um, yeah. So um, just in terms of the hardening and the softening, so just to remember the uh, x-axis scale, so is the upper right, what sort of percentage of, um, or what packing fraction of the impurities, did you have the hardening? Let's just see. Okay, so about point, very small. There we are. And around, let's see, it started to soften maybe around a little bit below 10%. Okay. Right. I just So in the softening, is that presumably some of the, um, anisotropic impurities, the ellipses, ellipses, if you will, are sort of starting to rotate some. I mean, are they grouping a little? I guess it's in between then the no, the lower to that they it starts to soften. Um, no, no, that you can actually see because it's actually that can be answered experimentally. Yeah. So do uh, you so, see, yeah. So the answer. What do you see? That, kind of motion or deformations uh, for the softening case. Go ahead. Sorry. Uh, I, sorry, actually, in the PRL, uh, there's a um, online material was supplied uh, of a video. You can see the particles moving mm -hmm. along there. Uh huh. Interesting. Yeah, actually, this huh. guy really behaved like a quantity disorder. Okay, so some are stuck. You're saying, and then they 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 they'll just stay there. Yeah. Okay. All right. Interesting. They, like a big rock, stay there, hmm. and then the the water flow by. Okay, thanks. I'll, I'll think about it yeah. some more. Yeah, this particle is not, remember, this particle is not heavier than the other particle because the weight mm -hmm. is the same. Okay, right, right, so, right. No. So, you, yeah. so you, you don't have to worry about the glass surface somehow because the particle is heavier, gets stuck on the surface. The sure, no, no, no. I, yeah, because I'm not worried it, about that. I'm just thinking about what types of, can you, do you see rotations or, you know, of the um, no. ellipses and whatnot? Like what type no. of deformation fields? And this is sort of showing some of that, but yeah. yeah. It's actually dislocation motion. Okay, it's dislocation, a, great. Yeah, it's a thermally active dislocation motion. Okay, interesting. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so um, this is, is that Jen I'm talking to? Yes, Jen, yes, uh, sorry. Hi, hi. Yeah. Um, so so um, uh, I know you, you're very familiar with uh, glassy systems. So this right. is actually the simplest way to make a glass, essentially. Right, you essentially when you uh, when you have a uh, round the particles, mm -hmm. in order if you have mixed up uh, two types of particles with different diameters, you never create a, right. a glass. You always get a crystallized of different sizes, phase separated. Okay, mm -hmm. and then in order to create a colloidal glass, you need to have like a three or five times different diameters and mix them up, you can create a two-dimensional colloidal glass. Or I guess people, as we've learned recently, you can create sort of polyhedra that are kind of weird shaped, but 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 agree, it, it's it's hard right. to make a glass with the, the spheres totally. Right. If you only created two systems, uh, uh, two types of particles and they create a glass, this is the first time I see it. That's why when I saw it, I was so excited. Because this, yeah, no, it's beautiful. I, I did, yeah, right. I, I didn't know you can make a glass this way, but uh, when Tushin showed me this, uh, his, stu uh, his student was making. I said, "Wow, this this is a question that my customers have been talking about it for twenty years, but never got the money to do it." And then so, so he, so so here we go. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm definitely gonna uh, look at look at your apparel more carefully. Okay, okay thank you. Do you have any other questions among audience? So what's the next uh, plan, uh, Sean, uh, uh, after next, this? Uh, uh, the plan is we, Mike and I have a secret agenda. <laughs> uh, our secret agenda is we felt that for the last decades, several decades, the people have been on the wrong track on the glass question. Jen know about this. In the, um, uh, when Jen was in graduate school, uh, Jen, you did your thesis with Daniel Fisher, right? I did indeed. Uh, okay, so Daniel Fisher used to, in his younger days, he almost got into fist fight with people 
regarding vortex glass. Okay. And then he argued, I think it now from hindsight correctly, that vortex glass is a new phase of matter. Um, uh, 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 when I was a postdoc at Yale, I actually did a PRL on, on that, uh, tested one of his hypotheses, there's an infinite energy barrier because of the line tension. So I made the wire uh, very thin. You can see the ohmic response in that system. So vortex glass, um, uh, the, the reason Daniel Fisher was considered a crazy person during that time, because there was a famous physicist, uh, Professor Phil Anderson said, in the 60s, the vortices uh, of type two superconductors, when you add a random pinning, you basically made a system into a sluggish liquid. And he called a flux creep. He made it, so at the time there was a huge fight in, in the vortex community. When Daniel Fisher and his brother, Matthew Fisher, and David Hughes argued, uh, said no, because of the line tension, the system is actually a thermodynamic, uh, the, uh, a, a, a new phase. Today, Mike and I secretly believe window glass is a vortex glass, but don't quote me publicly yet, okay? Uh, uh, because we don't well, have any proof. But uh, he, you should talk proof. to Daniel. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I would talk to Daniel. He'd be very happy <laughs> because because many people think that actually I used to believe it. Window glass is just a frozen liquid, um, but Today, I look at more and more of glass systems. I think Daniel Fisher and the Matthew Fisher were right that the, 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 you really needed to look from the point of, of dynamics. If there is a mechanism to create an infinite energy barrier, okay, I don't care about the thermodynamic ground state. The system is a new thermodynamic state. So that Daniel Fisher is correct. And then, so, Mike and I secretly believe there might be a similar mechanism, but we are looking at something very simple. So I can tell you that one simple system we're looking at uh, is a one-dimensional IC model with one of our square interaction, right? So that system that uh, Anderson and Yuval solved. Uh, yeah, and that has an unusual phase transition in the sense of it's sort of a hybrid where it's sort of there's some quantities right. that jump sort of discontinuously, but there's also, you know, some continuous elements right. to, the, right, to right, the phase right. transition. So it's right. very interesting transition. Right. Yeah. Right, right. Jane, you studied Anderson Yuval. That's very good. Okay. <laughs> so when you add a disorder to the Anderson Yuval, you create a essentially a Larkin Emery model system. So that system is the simplest the one dimensional system that we think that might be a glassy phase that we can also might be able to do experiment on. So, so this mm. is something that uh, we can attack from a theoretical side uh, from some simple uh, uh, a theoretical argument but we can also maybe able to create an experiment on it. So, so we, are, we are back to the the old days where people almost get into fist fight about the nature of glass, but now we secretly believe that we can actually, we might be able to make a progress on it, real progress. So um, uh, that's something that I leave you. I'm sorry that I completely left the nanopore field because uh, uh, I feel that my legacy in nanopore is done because uh, the reason I cannot uh, continue to work on nanopores uh, at Brown in the United States, and also I have a company doing the same thing in China. I don't want to be arrested by FBI. Okay, so FBI said I cannot use American resources to help communist China. I agree. Uh, so, so, but the real reason is that I'm more excited about this unsolved glass problem. Uh, I, so I felt that. Um, the remember the the paradigm of of landau that uh, the the phase transition happens when you have a spontaneous symmetry breaking the low temperature order phase has a broken symmetry the long wavelength rigidity is protected by broken symmetry so that paradigm has been torn down by costless and thalas right where we 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 know now you can have a 
a phase transition, you can have a topological phase transition without the order parameter and then without long range order, but you can have a, a loss of uh, long wavelength rigidity, okay? So the same question can be posed for this glassy phase. Can we have long range rigidity, long wavelength rigidity without so basically, along with the rigidity and the broken symmetry should be completely separate. So, so in other words, we were misled by Landau for almost a, you know almost a hundred years. <laughs> that's the, I, I'm sorry, I apologize to Landau. So, but but, but <laughs> yeah, no, that's great because also in like rigidity percolation models, trying to establish kind of a Landau Ginzburg approach has been it really it doesn't work. Okay. And so kind of searching for a new approach, you know, is important. And right. I think this is this is very interesting work and the nice interface between theory and, and experiments is even right. better. Right, Jen, you need to go back and talk to Daniel more. He has more um, crazy ideas. I don't know if we're really on speaking terms, <laughs> but I can go try to talk to him. <laughs> okay, so. I'll try, I'll try. I spoke to him, uh, this was 1994. So that's what mm -hmm. it was. That's 28 years ago. So mm -hmm. he was a, he was young and passionate, right? And then everybody, that's one way to describe it. Yes. <laughs> everybody okay, yes. thought everybody I thought he was crazy, but today I just remember many of his said things he said makes so much sense now sense, yeah. today than it was uh, than before. Mm -hmm. uh, I think at that, at that time, because Phil, uh, Phil Anderson was literally next door, right? So we yeah. just uh, were fearful of pissing him off, right? So the, uh, right. Uh, and the plus everything Phil Anderson said is, is essentially gospel, right? So, right, uh, right, yeah. right. And then, um, so, but yeah, you, I think, well, I mean, Daniel's working more on like biophysics stuff, but it, you know, I would reach out to him or if you want me to reach out to him and yeah, get him back, draw him back into the glass. I mean, now that Parisi has won the Nobel Prize, I don't know, right. maybe he's more like, okay. Right, right, right. So, so I, I yeah. think the, uh, there will be a Nobel Prize on the glass problem. I, I Fisher, certainly hope so. Yeah. yeah, Daniel Fisher should be on the uh, podium. Uh, uh, mm. <laughs> <laughs> um, <okay. laughs> Um, yeah. <laughs> yes, because vortex glass in the nineties, in when I was uh, in my twenties, I'm now fifty seven. So when I was twenty seven, Daniel Fisher was talking about the, this vortex glass, and everybody was excited. Everybody thought that he was crazy, but today, I think mm -hmm. he's right. And mm -hmm. uh, um, uh, I'm sorry that I did not. Take Talk his to him more, or, more yeah. I didn't yeah. take him more seriously yeah. back when I was an assistant professor because I when I was assistant, prof assistant professor I had a starting a fund I can I can do whatever I want, whatever right? want. I, right. I should right. I should have investigated his thoughts a little more I regret it yeah that's okay if you go <laughs> tell him that I think he'll he'll start thinking about it again <laughs> okay yeah All right thanks thank you thank you. <laughs> So if, if we don't uh, have any other questions, I'd like to thank everybody for this both exciting uh, talk and uh, exciting discussions. And thank you very much. Uh, have a nice weekend. And then thank you, Sean, for a lot of inspiration that and drive that you have. <laughs> and that is uh, quite contagious for our graduate students and even for ourselves, you know, how much passion you put. And then you add all these distinctions in, in a historical facts with different people. You know, that's nice. Okay. Thank all you. Right. Thank, again. Thank, thank you, Olivia. Great to see you guys. Jen, great to see bye. you. Okay. Bye. Thank you. We'll, we'll talk later. So okay. I'll talk, talk to you later. All right. Okay. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye. Okay. Uh, oh.